And uh, welcome to Brevia Biome. So today we've got John Ford who is helping us create the mycelium wall, which is really, really cool. Um, John's actually moved in about 500 metres away as a crow flies from my place in Mombolk. Uh, Ray, who's an old mate, um, has given him some space to live out his dreams and take, <laughs> slowly taking over the whole property. I'll just explain what's happened this week at the greenhouse. We've had a few stuff ups. I flooded the place. Um, I realized that the uh, aquaponic system was running a little bit low. So I decided to top it up and then got a phone call from someone in the loading dock saying I can't get in. So I quickly ran down there, totally forgot about the water, walked back in and we had a waterfall. And luckily the yabby survived, but um, yeah, it was a bit stressful. We also had, um, trying to do everything without you know, glues and doing things sustainably is not the easiest thing. Um, we've had our tables actually bow because we're gluing zinc. I love using zinc. Um, I went to a kitchen in France that had, it was like hundreds of years old and had this beautiful zinc top. So I've always loved using zinc. But trying to bond it to the, the timber carcass has actually made it bend. So we've actually cut it and, and making it level again. Um, we're about two weeks away from finishing, so it's getting really, really exciting now. And uh, we've got the front door arrived this week, finally, and that's getting installed and um, putting the floor down. And we tested it on Saturday. It's a floor where you're earthed, so we're actually laying it onto copper. So we've got cork going down, then copper, and then tiles that are made in chitin. And the idea is that you're connected to the Earth's magnetic field. So when you're walking bare feet in this house, you'll actually be earthed. And um, it's pretty interesting walking around with this monitor that actually shows whether you're connected or not and trying to work out what works and what doesn't work. Anyway, by Saturday night, we had that sorted out. So we'll be laying that later this week. And so we're getting so close and it's getting really exciting now. So mushrooms. What I'm trying to do here is build an ecosystem and that the, in nature nothing is more important than another element. Everything is as important as each, each element. And um, I was first introduced to mushrooms by a guy called Tony Leonardis back in uh, 1993. We moved into a warehouse in South Melbourne in Market Street, Jenny and I, and uh, I met uh, Tony on a dance floor at the Chevron. And uh, we both realized that flowers needed to be kept at four degrees and so did mushrooms. And we <laughs> both started our businesses at the same time. And so we decided to share a warehouse together. And that's actually my introduction to restaurants as well. So Tony was supplying Blue Train and Blake's and um, the Flower Drum, all these amazing restaurants with incredible mushrooms. I think at one stage he was selling over 60 different varieties of mushrooms from all over the world. So the business was called Just Mushrooms Exotic and Wild. But what really blew me away was when we spent weekends together. So he'd come up to Mombolk and on the road where I lived were these really old pine trees. And so for years, I had walked over and stumbled over these pine mushrooms that I didn't even realize were that amazing. So he got me picking these mushrooms. And, you know, some weekends we'd make like $1,000 just on picking some mushrooms that we'd sell to restaurants like Syracuse and European that put them on the menu and so it was really Tony that got me fascinated with mushrooms and from that moment on there was no looking back and um, I started to understand that also mycelium you know we on the farm we've used mushroom compost for years and we know what it does to soils and and so for me there's two two huge benefits to mushrooms there's the fruit which is the mushroom and then there's a the mycelium and so they've got this incredible way of transforming um, woody uh, waste into something that soils just, go, just love. And then I was really fascinated with the work of um, a couple of scientists in New York that um, isolated a bacteria called Mycobacterium vaceae, which is a soil-borne bacteria, which actually uh, is, uh, uh, occurs as a result of mycelium um, combined with worms and, and high microflora levels. And they, they actually fed this... Um, this bacteria to mice and the mice navigated a maze in half the time and, and their uh, heart rates dropped and their anxiety levels dropped. And so it meant that all this research, this is in 2009, all this research started about this soil borne bacteria um, being really valuable for as a, you know, an antidepressant, as um, a way to improve serotonin levels. 
And of course, anybody that gardens or anyone that spends a lot of time outside knows that you don't need, you know, of course this is true, you know. So, we, you know, the world's focusing on particular isolated bacteria, but I think that what we will, in the future, will understand is that it's so complex that we can't isolate these things. They're all working together. So, we all generate a huge amount of waste that we currently put into our, whether it's recycling bin or into our bins, that actually can be the food for mycelium and then result in mushrooms. And uh, my mate Ray told me about someone that he's, you know, was in, I think Ray was doing some gardening for you, some landscaping yeah, for Yeah, he was, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, said, oh my God, this guy's so passionate about mushrooms and I'm going to give him some space to live out his dream. And that's yeah. where we met. Yeah, absolutely. I don't yeah. know how many years ago was that. Does it, oh, it's yeah, yeah a couple of years ago now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've moved into being a full-time farmer. Which I wasn't, which wasn't, it's not my... Um, what was a hobby for you? Really well, wasn't. Yeah, it was a hobby for about five years, growing um, amazing mushrooms and, you know, being so inquisitive about the, the way they grow, about, you know, uh, their different textures and flavors, their role in the ecosystem. I mean, that, you know, all of it and just, you know, now I grow, you know, over a dozen different varieties and I'm always trying to look for new ones to, to, to put onto the menus and, yeah, I just, I just love it. I don't know, what can I say? So, you know... I've tried to explain my idea of a zero waste system of growing mushrooms and you've been unbelievable in helping me realize that dream. But I think a lot of people want to know, where does it start? Where did it start with you? Because you've got a really interesting background. I mean, <laughs> yeah. this is not, the, mushroom growing was a hobby for you, but like, um, go back to where it started for you. Huh. Yeah, look, um, I've always loved, always loved mushrooms, always loved fungi, um, whether they be out in the wild or whether they be something that you eat. So that's just been my thing ever since I was young. I mean, I, I used to spend times as a teenager out in the forest looking for mushrooms. You know, maybe, you know, we could find some, you know, magical ones as well. But most of our focus was on actually identifying mushrooms. We were just fascinated by these things that could just pop up in the middle of the forest and you wouldn't, you know, without any warning at all. And so you would go somewhere and you'd come back two weeks later and you'd have totally different mushrooms growing in the same location. And so um, for me and a good friend of mine, Daniel, back when I was a teenager, we used to go to our favorite spots and, and just, just enjoy that sort of the change in nature and how the mushrooms, or you have a tree that might last for 50 years, but the mushrooms, every two weeks, you might have something different. And so it made, made nature so exciting, I guess, yeah. um, in that sense. Um, and I guess that sort of simmered along for a long time. Um, and I never, I never thought you could grow these. Like, I mean, look at this now. For me, if, if I, you know, if the, the 15 or 20-year-old me looked back and saw these mushrooms, they'd be like, what, what the hell are they? You know, yeah. I... I mean, this, um, is, this is the most incredible... So explain this one. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a lion's mane mushroom. Um, yeah, it's always called like monkey's brain and there's a whole lot of other kind of um, crazy, crazy names for it. Um, but it's, it's incredibly dense um, and beautiful flavor, actually. It's sort of almost, almost like a seafood sort of flavor, um, and you can sort of slice it. And it's, uh, anyway, I'll, we'll talk about the cooking, but we can talk about the actual roll of it. Um, it grows on dead wood. Um, we, do have, we do have some uh, Australian, Australian varieties of this um, as well, and a bit of it is found all around the that's world. That's this one, right? Well, we do have this one. This one has been found okay. in Australia. Oh, really? yeah. So, yeah, yeah that wow. one's been found in Australia too. But um, the one that's more, um, the very interesting one, I guess, is, is this one. So this one's called, um, we've called it the snowflake, because basically, it, um, well, I was the first one to bring it onto the market here in Australia. Um, it's also known as the coral tooth mushroom in the wild. Um, and uh, yeah, we were able to, uh, me and, and, and Russell, uh, um, a colleague of mine, um, were able to find it, work out how you grow it, and um, here we are, and we're the first one to, to grow it. It's called the, we call it the snowflake. We kind of put it out for a competition to say, like, you know, this is a new mushroom. Like, you know, it doesn't even have a name. Can you believe that? It's kind of crazy, right? It didn't even have found a name. In, um, allowed to say where you found it? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, the, um, so we, we've got two clones. One of them was found in the Otways, and the other one was found in Emerald. So Emerald is obviously close to, to where your snaya. Um, and yeah, we've taken clones of those, and we're able to grow them up. Um, so yeah, it's a native mushroom, the first, I guess, native mushroom that's come um, onto, the, onto the culinary scene um, here in Australia. And I've got a, a couple of others that I'm trialing and growing at the moment, native mushrooms. So um, that's a real passion of mine, to bring an actual native food to Australians because most of these mushrooms and even the, you know, you talk about pine mushrooms that you might forage for, the pine mushrooms, the slippery jacks, um, all these, they're all introduced mushrooms. 
Um, they, they, so they, how can they, we bring they, they the exist native... because we brought those trees yeah, in. We yeah, we brought those trees in, right? Yeah. But um, we do have native fungi out there that are edible. Um, how do we start cultivating those? How do we cu start cultivating the, the, the varieties that are actually meant to be here, I guess, in that sense, and that, um, and that we can sort of, uh, yeah, I guess we can bring to the plates of people knowing that it's a native species. What I love about this place or, you know, where we are, is that we've got yabbies and we've got barramundi arriving tomorrow and mm -hmm. um, freshwater mussels. And these is that they probably, you know, 60,000 years of eating these foods here, if not more. Mm -hmm. yep. And I find that, you know, we're using really modern techniques to try and create these foods, but yep. they're actually, you know, I'm trying to recreate an ecosystem. And yep. I love that your passion for finding these native, I mean, this one too here is incredible, this um, abalone. Yeah. Mushroom. I mean, it's like a work of art. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, so this is an, um, an abalone oyster mushroom. And to my knowledge, I don't know uh, if anyone's grown it commercially here in Australia before. It's, it's quite rare around the world. Um, but it's, it, I mean, it really looks like a black lip ab abalone, if you can sort of show it up like that. I mean, the, the frills underneath and the edges really look like a, a local black lip ab abalone. Um, but incredible texture, like this kind of crunch that you just can't cook it out. Like it just re retains this crunch and you can cook it a lot like an abalone actually, just really sharp and, um, you know, sharp and hot. Um, so yeah, it's, it's another amazing one. And, um, but this is what excites me, bringing these new and interesting varieties. So um, we've actually just bypassed the whole point of yeah, what I was trying, I I was trying to ask where we it started for so you. so excited about them. Um, <laughs> and we talk about abalones actually. Pretty, and actually, before I say this, um, as I said, this is a seafood. Um, the lion's mane, um, getting back to this connection, right? Abalone mushroom. The lion's mane, um, when, you, when you cook it, you can pick it and it's almost like crab, all right? And so like crab, and, and this one here, the snowflake has got, I would say, a kind of lobster flavor to it, like this sweet kind of lobster flavor to it. And so I probably find uh, all these seafood references because that, that is my main... That's um, your background. That's my main background is that um, I was, yeah, I'm, I'm a, tr a trained marine biologist, I guess, and I worked... Uh, a lot with, uh, and still work uh, with fishermen um, around fishery sustainability and sustainable seafood uh, is my background. Um, but I guess what, what I kind of came out with is that I was working with all these fantastic fishermen and they really had a lot of pride in the product that they produced, right? They were really kind of, you know, there's a real stewardship of the ocean and that what they were producing in a, in a sustainable way and then the way they, they put it upon, you know, they handed it over to chefs and, and there, was, there was pride in it, you know, it was good quality. And... Um, being a scientist, you know, you write reports, you help people out, but, you know, you don't get a lot of feedback, to be honest. You know, like, as a scientist, you, you kind of, um, you kind of just got to take one of the gratitude way, where it is, you know, like, um, it's a bit of a tough road. Um, and I was kind of sick of it. And I was like, I want what those fishermen want. I want to produce something with my hands, or, well, not just to produce it, because it's the mushrooms that are growing, not, not, not me, but um, to actually work with something, to, to produce something, and hand it over, and people go, wow. That's actually really cool, and I'm really excited by it. And um, I was like, I'd love to be a fisherman, but I don't really have the build for a fisherman. You ever seen fishermen? They're kind of, yeah. Um, not really my thing, pulling in nets. Um, so I was thinking about what passion I did have, and the passion was mushrooms, right? And so I was so passionate about, about growing mushrooms, started doing a hobby, and I was like, how can I transition this? How can I get to a point where I'm growing something that I'm intensely proud of? I mean, I love that. And the, yeah, hand it over. The, know, like, Ray was explaining to me, I mean, you hadn't even thought about really moving he just I still remember the first conversation he was working for you yeah. and he said there's this guy you know you've got to come like he called me when he was at your place you've got to come here and see this because yeah. you had you're in Upway yep and you, your whole yard was full of growing, shipping, shipping shipping ship, containers <laughs> and he said oh my god this guy's out of control you know and and yeah. the neighbors were starting to yeah you know, the neighbors were complaining about the noise of the fans and yeah and look and that's fine like you know yeah. but i mean it, it, it is yeah. a great you know if you're passionate about something then you know and you love what you do you're a great example of mm in almost no time at all, turning it around into something, and especially like the whole COVID situation is actually, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I know at the start we discussed, you were really concerned about where you would, what, what that would, because you were supplying yeah. restaurants and, and, yeah. and it actually, you know, changed your whole business. You actually, oh, sure. you know, you, you also decided to make the most of the situation and really force, you force yourself to change. Yeah. But I think it's a great example of turning a passion into you know, something that makes a good income and, yep. and um, not only that, you're now employing people and, you know, you've, yep. got, you've created this hub. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that 
like the, the passion, the passion is, really, is really important. You can't rely always on passion. I found that, I've learned that in the past because um, you will drain yourself. Yep. So um, you still need to produce a business. So you've got to, as much as the passion, you still need to think about it with a business mind. And the best way to do that is to do all, most of your failing before you become a business. Okay, so all those years of doing it in the backyard, which I've got, to learn, mushroom, from, I've got to learn from you. Mushroom, okay, so mushroom growing is really hard, okay? Um, it is just a process of failing less over time, okay? And luckily for me, I did a lot of that failing early on. And so I spent a couple of years doing it in the backyard and so on. So I could slowly build the business and, um, and, and, and not lose out. And, um, and that's pretty important for farming full stop, I think. And when you're yep. working with living organisms, is that sort of jumping in and just going, I can do it or someone else is doing it. Um, surely I can do it. Um, there's, there's a way you've got, to, you've got to understand. You've got to connect with living organisms. Um, you can't control them. In a, in a sense that you can just think you can just start a farm and just, just you know, do it. Uh, it doesn't work. So luckily I did that failing and that, and that understanding, that learning about living, the living organisms of the, of the fungi um, and, then, and then was able to turn that into a business. So yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a pretty intense ride. Um, but here I am and um, you know, surrounded by you know, like-minded people who are passionate about, about growing things, about growing things sustainably. I mean, look at this house and to be able to add my knowledge and my expertise and, and all those failings to this house and how it become more practical, how it become more sustainable and sort of, and keep in and, and sort of have that cycling within, each, within itself become, you know, um, self-sufficient to some extent, or even in, in food, in, in, in food uh, sources, then um, yeah, it's really exciting to be able to be a part of it. Well, I mean, yeah. what, one of the things that, you know, the, the, the current food system is obviously detrimental to the environment there's so many studies that are showing that and to me it's like there's so many solutions to that problem you know but just growing more food where you live you know yeah. and so the um the opportunity and the capacity for us to be able to grow mushrooms where we live and then mm. not only that like i just think that there's so much um so much benefit to growing your own food from a psychological level. Like even if you plant oh, a seed sure. and then yeah. it becomes something and then, you know, that, yeah. that joy of raising something, you're yeah. productive and mm. you, you, you're nurturing something. Yep. There, there's so much waste that currently goes to landfill. Yeah. And, you know, I put a post up this morning saying that you could use cardboard and paper and people mm. go, yep, that's recycled. It yeah. can be recycled, but the, the point is that I know a lot of it doesn't get recycled. Yeah. So even though we might... so. I love the idea that we kind of start realizing that our waste is not waste. It's actually mm. treasure. That's yep. actually a food source Absolutely. for something else. Yep. And then each food source could actually be, once you start to understand that certain mushrooms prefer mm. certain elements, mm. I mean, the idea of Paul Stamets and, you know, um, from cancer cures and what it does for, you know, um, overall well-being. And, you know, one of the things that I want to do here mm. is... Obviously, the mushroom downstairs is connected to the bathroom, and so when you have a shower, you, you're utilizing the steam that you generate, and then, you know, the, we've got a great system where we've got a dryer. When mm. we're not washing, when we're not drying our, our clothes, we're using a dryer, and then we're collecting that water from yep. the dryer, adding that to the, the worm, uh, to the mushroom, mushroom, so we create yep. steam. Yep. And then, you know, we're creating, uh, it's part of a closed system, but then, yep. ultimately, you've got this incredible product at the end. Yep. The mushroom's great, yeah. but for me, like, what this does to soil is oh, incredible. Absolutely. And look, as you said before, like the, um, getting on that, that last stage of like, you know, what's in here is, is sawdust, right? I mean, the amazing thing about mushrooms is that they can eat, eat most things, right? And that's, that's what makes them so well, important part of the, yeah. our waste system, just as they're such an important part of the ecosystem, say, in a forest or in a grassland. I mean, I mean, fungi are really, they've kind of for so long have been the forgotten element of our ecosystems. I mean, so the you, forgotten so element how, of living big, How big is the biggest single mycelium? Oh, yeah. Ever so the, yeah, the, biggest, yeah, the biggest organism in the world is a, is a honey fungus. Um, it's somewhere, I can't remember, in the US. But, um, you know, it's square kilometers. It's huge. Um, I don't have the and numbers on the top and of and my the head. Genetic, but the, yeah, it's, it's basically, one, one yeah, out. it's just this one organism that is growing all through the root system and some through the trees and under the ground. Um, and it plays its role. You know, it plays its role in decomposing the woody structures. I mean, if we didn't have fungi um, out there, we would just have a whole, we would be buried in wood. You yeah. know, we'd probably be buried, yeah, we'd just be buried in raw wood because really there's no nothing else out there that is going to be breaking down that um, you're breaking down the, sort of the, 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 the cell walls and the cellulose and so on from, from wood. And, you know, they are incredibly important. 
And so, yeah, and often we completely forget that. And, you know, we look out, I can look out the window here, which you can't see, but if you look outside here, we've got some gardens here in the side of Fed Square. I mean, the number of fungi species, fungal species that will be just under that garden bed, it, you know, there's more fungal species out there than there are plants. Yeah. We can't see them, but they're out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And so the, um, I remember last year you gave me a whole bunch of, you know, I think it was 20 plus different varieties of mushrooms that I used for an installation mm -hmm. at the Stoke House. Mm. And the, it, what I was trying to highlight that mycelium is actually a great alternative for styrofoam. Mm. Yep. And, you know, IKEA is now launching even products where they, they're replacing the styrofoam corners for really high value products with mycelium yep. um, grown blocks. And I remember going to Dan Barber's wasted pop-up mm -hmm. where the tables were grown you know yeah. they were yeah and a week later i went back to pull the installation apart and some of the mushrooms had actually eaten into yeah. the star and that, i couldn't <laughs> pull them apart and i just like wow you know and yeah. they of course they're used for cleaning up oil spills and yeah. you know yeah by remediation of um, contaminated lands and a whole lot of things i mean this is the role that they play in nature and i in many ways, we've kind of been blind to that for so long. You know, we just got to look out there in, in the ecosystem, see what role they play, and then go, how can we take that role and use it in our systems? And you just, in a system like this in the house, I mean, you know, clearly we're taking, we'll take waste materials, whether that be, most of these are grown on sawdust, but, um, you know, is, they will eat paper, cardboard, um, as you say, that's not a lot of, a lot of the Actually, right? a lot of the materials and, that are problematic to recycle. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, there are even... Uh, there are even fungi that will break down types of plastic. Um, so, you know, th th they pay a part in that cycle, but also be giving us food at the same time. And then the product at the end of the day, so after these mushrooms are, um, have sort of, you know, taken the nutrients that they can out of this product, then you can compost it again and then it makes soil. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, it is the first step to making soil. So they're a primary decomposer. You may need to then decompose them again. You've got secondary decomposers, which again are bacteria and fungi, and then you'll create soil. So it's generally like a two-step process to do it. But all these mushrooms that I grow are primary decomposers. So they're breaking down that, that initial um, sort of hard, woody structures. But, um, but and the crazy so, thing so, is... I mean, it's really food for... Yeah. We're, we're, you know, you can't have micro life in soil or you can't have microflora in soil. You've got to feed them just like yeah, us. exactly. So they rely on air, water and nutrients. So yes. you, what we're doing when we're adding compost... We're not, that doesn't make the perfect soil. It actually, it's just food for the yeah. microflora in the soil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's really interesting that um, last, like I was doing a lot of research on vitamin D and how the Ukrainians over, they think over a thousand years have actually gone out and picked mushrooms in autumn yeah. and then dried them in the sun with the gills facing up. Yeah. And they, these American uh, scientists did this study on, on like one mushrooms and it was equivalent to a month's worth yeah. of vitamin D yeah. because the gills, you know, the surface area is so large. Yeah. And these people are probably lying in the sun because that's what they yeah. think they're supposed to do. But without, you know, yeah. obviously they've got these long winters with no sunlight, but they, were, they have these really high vitamin D levels yeah. during the winter because every day they eat. Absolutely. These dried, sun-dried mushrooms. And, and again, I mean, this, there are all these reasons why we should be eating more mushrooms, I guess, in that sense, but also that why we should be, you know, having them as a part of our food systems much more locally and much more at home, just like, you know, we will be doing in this house. I mean, growing mushrooms, you know, there is a trick to them. It's not easy, particularly on doing it on a, grow, on a large scale, but, um, you know, there are people like myself who can, you but know, who can assist in that sort of process. They and, are surprisingly and resilient able, too, though. And they are resilient. Yeah, you can... Um, yeah, exactly. They, they, they will survive. The mushrooms themselves might not survive, but the mycelium, the body of the mushroom, will survive. It will be there. It is there for the next time when you do provide it with the right um, sort of conditions in which to, to fruit and, and form mushrooms. Um, but it is something that I think that we need to include more in our foods, in our food systems, and in our local food systems as well. Yeah. And um, because it's all great, sort of working on a, on a farm level. But how, does it, how do we work it in sort of where people are actually providing, you know, food for their local community or food for their own um, household? Um, because nothing beats fresh. I mean, you just pick these. I mean, they're taking all the nutrients from the local, you know, the sawdust or, the, or, um, or whatever local materials you're putting in there. Um, and they're turning it all into good stuff for you. Yeah, which and, is available And it's us. not sitting around. It's not, it does not take in weeks to get here from, you know, being grown in China and, and, uh, or Korea, which most of our exotic mushrooms in Australia are, 
um, uh, you know, are come from overseas or, or, the, um, or the materials, say the, the sawdust or the, the blocks there, are actually imported directly from China and then they're just picked in Australia. So the majority of our gourmet mushrooms, uh, that, is, that is how we do it. I mean, we're not even using our own waste. We're using, you know, waste generated in another country, bringing it here and then eat, eating oh. the mushrooms from it. It's, it's crazy whilst we have problems with our own waste systems. So it's, it's, it's insane in that way. You know, how can we make this a bigger thing? I mean, I'm not here to take over the world with, um, you know, to, to, to sell a million mushrooms. But, but I love how that, can I, I take I, this? I love to that the... you're passionate about encouraging urban mm. um, production of, you know, that we, that we decentralize the food system and potentially, mm. you know, could have millions of people in Australia growing mushrooms. Absolutely. And I'd love at every farmer's market around the country that there was someone, you know, where you have, you have someone there selling mushrooms. I mean, I think that that is a really... Uh, you know, it's, it's a fantastic thing to aim for. I mean, you don't, it doesn't need to be a huge farm. It could be just someone in their backyard potentially gets to a certain scale and, um, and be able to go to the weekend market every week. I think that's great to have that fresh food available and it's, 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 it's possible. It's, it's, not, it's not easy, but it's possible. Yeah. It's amazing once you eat really, really fresh mushrooms it's actually really difficult to go and buy mushrooms. <laughs> so true. Yeah, like yeah. It's, it's, and I think that that's what will end up happening. Anybody yeah. that has, like, has picked, like we, we hope to actually allow some of the people that come in through here pick yeah. and then yeah. you know, through different, Matt and Joe will use mm. different methods of, we've got some really clever ways that we can get people really excited by them. Yeah. But then it's really difficult. That's like having really fresh, you know, a great tasting strawberry or yeah. anything, yeah. a snow pea that's harvested. Yep. And that's what this project is really about. But I'm, I wanted to talk to you about some of the, the research that's being done around cancer and um, how certain mushroom species are doing. I mean, Paul Stamets is obviously... For, do you want to explain who Paul Stamets is for people that don't know? Yeah, um, look, Paul Stamets uh, is from, I think, Washington, I think. Anyway, somewhere in the, the northwest of the, of the US. And um, he is pretty much mushroom god. Um, I think that most people would, who know him would probably agree with that. Um, so Paul Stamets um, is, he basically has written, literally written the books on mushroom cultivation, particularly on medicinal mushroom cultivation um, for the West. All right? So a lot, of the, um, a lot of mushroom cultivation knowledge actually comes from, uh, from Asia. Um, but he was sort of the person who brought a lot of that, in, a lot of that knowledge uh, to, um, to Western countries. Um, but also being able to champion them, to champion them for their... For their um, nutritional benefit, their medicinal benefit, and actually their psychoactive um, benefits as well uh, is, is, a, is a big thing of his as well. But um, he's, he's pretty much um, the person that all, uh, all people that are into fungi, or, or won't talk for everyone, but most people who are into fungi really look up to. Um, and so he really champions um, he's got fungi some great, as being... some great TED Talks, TED Med. Yeah. So Google TED Med. It's a brilliant one yeah. with his mum. In it, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, and he, he's a great speaker, and he's got a lot of really good. Um, yeah, you, really good you need to watch it really. five times because yeah, yeah. he speaks so fast. Yeah, yeah, he's just passionate. I hope I'm not speaking too fast because I'm passionate too. But um, I think that really, it really comes out with him. So um, yeah, he's absolute, uh, absolute amazing. And look, um, I think that when it comes to sort of the nutritional and the medicinal benefits of mushrooms, um, it's sort of something that's always sort of sat a little bit um, on the side of our traditional medicine, of course. Um, uh, it's a, a lot of the, again, from sort of um, Eastern Asian um, Chinese medicine and so on, has, um, has long sort of, you know, uh, the lion's mane, the reishi, the turkey tail, and things like this have been a big part of, um, of Chinese medicine in particular. Um, but it's only sort of really catching on now when, not, not from a, not from a uh, pharmaceutical point of view, I think that that's sort of, you know, it's a completely different story. I mean, they're not being sort of necessarily made medicines, but it, um, I think someone like Paul Stamets is really trying to put it out there to saying, hey, they can be, or they should be. Yeah. You know what I mean? We have ignored these for too long, um, and we're just trying to cure, you know, symptoms for things, but how do we actually improve our bodies? How do we actually fortify ourselves so that we don't get the symptoms in the end? And I think a lot of that is, um, and, and mushrooms, you know, have the capacity um, potentially to, to, to really fortify the body in that way. And that's been the real sort of push towards it. And that's where, um, yeah, certainly things like um, the lion's mane there is, um, you know, there, there is... Um, Evidence that it may be it may improve your, your brain your brain function and your memory and things like this and there's been a real revolution and sort of people taking that every day. Um, 
I'll just to say, I, I don't produce any of those products, so I'm not sort of trying to spruik them at all. I grow fresh mushrooms, and um, uh, there are people out there that, um, that will sell them medicinal. I, I don't do that, so um, I just I produce the mushrooms that you see in front of you. Um, but, I mean, regardless, fresh food, you know, food that is, no, we use no sprays, no chemicals, no anything. I mean, there's just sawdust in that, and we just spray them with water, like that's, Fresh air, that's kind of it, right? Yeah. And that's coming and, and getting to your plate as soon as we can do it, you know, and as soon as we can get it there. And like, you know, and the variety, I mean, you know, as you can see, something like this, this is our, um, this is our stir fry mix, actually. But we've got things like shiitake here. Um, we've got shimeji oysters, um, some little uh, namikos, which are very, very They're cute. They're beautiful. Yeah. They're a beautiful little mushroom. Um, the namiko, it's a Japanese mushroom, um, often used in, in miso soups to sort of thicken up the soup. We've got anoki here, and we've got my little namesake uh, king oyster mushrooms here. And so this is sort of a more of an Asian flavor. But if you look at that, I mean, you know, you've got, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five, five species there. It's right in front of you, right? You've got, you're eating five different species, all, all with their own nutritional benefits, you know, um, right there in a single meal. Um, yeah. Add five different veggies to that, and you've got ten different things you're eating in one go, right? And they're all fresh. I mean, it's, it's that's the variety, I think, is, the, is, is, is really what... What, what gives most to our body. And look at the colour, the insane colour of this. <laughs> I should have put a bigger one in, yeah. I mean, absolutely beautiful. So that's, um, yeah, that's a yellow or a golden, um, golden oyster. Um, like, really kind of interesting fruity, fruity aroma, um, almost a nutty, nutty flavour. They go really well in soups. Soups and, and like luxes and things like that, they're really, really good in. Um, but I think... Yeah, I think um, Matt and Joe used to sort of flame grill them or something and keep the, really kept the colour in them when you sort of really just smash them with a lot of heat in one go. Um, but yeah, but this is sort of, that's a mix of just oyster and mushrooms, blue, blue uh, oysters, some yeah. white oysters. Some so what oysters makes the blue there. oyster go blue? Um, oh, I give away all my secrets here. No. Um, no, the most important thing is, it, like most of these mushrooms, uh, they grow in autumn, right? And so, you know, you can try to grow them at high temperatures, but at the end of the day, they want to grow at low temperatures. And the lower you grow them, the bluer they get. So, just to give that tip for any budding mushroom know. growers out there who want to grow blue mushrooms as opposed to sun and grey mushrooms, uh, the lower the temperature, the darker they are. It's uh, just that. But yeah, but they're beautiful. And, um, you know, even getting back to that vitamin D thing, you know, I mean, like, I, I don't unfortunately have the time to sort of put all my mushrooms out in the sun for a couple of hours, but that's the sort of thing you can do at home. That's the sort of thing you can do when you have, when you're connected and you're local, um, you know, you have a local food system, you know, it's never going to be something where you, you, you know, you can do it on a commercial scale, but, you know, you do it in your backyard, put the mushrooms out in the sun for a few, yeah, beautiful. You can see there the gills, um, and... It's quite remarkable because the studies have shown that you only need to do it for 48 hours. There's no point doing it for longer than that. So in 48 hours, the mushroom will absorb all of the vitamin D it can possibly absorb. And like a mushroom like this will reduce down to a third of its size and be like rock hard. So we um, grate them just with a little file onto, you could put them onto mushroom soup or something like that. But a mushroom like this would be all that you would need to eat for a month to get the right vitamin D level. And the beauty about it is it's, it's a natural food, so it's not a medication. It's like your body knows how to absorb the vitamin D from this, you know? So I find it so fascinating mm. that one tiny mushroom could mm. be far superior to, you know, uh, yeah. me a medication that people are on. <laughs> and it's just something that we've been doing for a bloody long time and we've kind of just forgotten. Absolutely, and it's to do with natural absorption too. I mean, when you're, when you're eating a food, your, your body is, absorbing nutrients, it's sort of, it, it's geared up to do it, right? There's a whole lot of things in there. This is what we do every single day is eat food, right? And so you, to, put the, to put those nutrients in a food source, right, means that you take them up better than yeah. putting them in a pill or something like that when your body's not primed and not ready to sort of take them up. And so you end up just passing most of them out. So food is always the best, best place to get your nutrients. Mm. Okay, so where do, where do, if people go to a restaurant in Melbourne, which restaurants... Um, have your yes, people. Mushroom. You can go to a restaurant in Melbourne. I, I, I know. I <laughs> can't believe I can say that. <laughs> um, Good luck trying to get in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I got a, I got a booking. I got a booking in a couple of weeks at a restaurant. Anyway, I'll be, um, I'll be heading to. Where I'll be heading to next week. I'm going to Hazel, um, who have a really great with, um, who have a really great uh, uh, mushroom dish on at the moment. Shout out to um, Ollie and Bree there. They're um, fantastic chefs. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the places there. But um, uh, and also. Um, God, his, 
I'm going to roll off the list. Who's buying right now? Um, uh, Mr. Bianco, um, Joey Vargetto has been a fantastic um, supporter of what we do as well, um, as is Peter Gunn at, at, at Ida's. And there's been you know, a couple of people around the city who have been really, really fantastic. But it's out in the Yarra Valley that we really um, do <coughs> our best, sort of, you know, where my, um, I guess my most collaborative chefs are, because I get to go out and, and deliver it every week, right? So I get out to the Yarra Valley wineries um, and deliver it and actually have that sort of, that feedback. I don't unfortunately do my own deliveries in the city, so I don't get that connection with the chefs. Yep. Um, but out in the, out in the Yarra Valley, because that's where I am, um, I really get that. And that's, that's the best thing. Just to, I remember the look on like, you know, on Joe, Joe or Matt's face when I just bring them this mushroom that they're like, I'm just like, I know you've never seen this before. Like, you know, here you go, see what you can do with it. Um, and so, yeah, when Matt and Joe were at, at Oak Ridge. They were always like, you know, yeah, I, I just love that collaboration um, because I could bring them anything that was new and interesting and they would just like go, okay, they'd relish that challenge, you know, of going and the opportunity to go like, this is something that no one's ever cooked with, say in, in the whole country before. Um, and um, I love that, getting that feeling and getting that vibe, you know, and um, so, yeah. So that's, and, that's the reason why I'm so excited about this yeah. house. Same thing. It's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it gets an experiment with Matt and Joe, you know, yeah, yeah. try this or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, so, that, that, so Oak Ridge has been great. Um, so yeah, Tarawara, um, Civil Estate, um, Stones, I'm going to forget someone and they're going to, they're going to get no, me. And also me. though, if people <laughs> want to, they can actually come out on Saturdays and, and actually buy directly from you. Is that right? Um, I'm not sure where we're at that because, you know, COVID and everything. So uh, we kind yeah, of shut yeah. that all down. Yeah, right. um, we were doing it on Fridays that you could come and buy directly. But um, yeah, we've kind of, yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens in the new year. We're just, yeah, everything is in such flux at the moment that, um, yeah, we do want to start. We do want to start embedding in the local community a lot more um, with what we do as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, trying to get that, that collaborative. Um, well, you've got a Miller. Next yeah, door now. we do. James, um, James is starting to mill some brains. Um, so we're trying to start like a little collective, you know, yeah. in our um, in, in in Ray's place, which is where we um, where we where I grow my mushrooms. And so yeah, now we've got rock paper flour, which is um, uh, yeah. So to, so James and Glenn there um, uh, millers, and they've got the millers starting up. So we've got like flour produced here. We've got mushrooms growing here. We've got another space. So we've got. So I'll put it out there. We've got one other space um, in the yard. So if there's something compatible, if someone wants to come in with something cool, something to add to our little food collective. Um, and actually across the road awesome. is, is my brother. Yeah, yeah, across the road and, from your brother. And then uh, you've got, you've <laughs> like literally 10 meters across the road, but you've also got like great indoor plants being grown. And then a little bit further yeah. up, you've got Yarra Valley Herbs. Yeah, you got Yarra, yeah, and yeah, Matt, yeah. Dan, Matt and Dennis, Dennis. Dennis and Matt at Yarra Valley Herbs yeah. doing the microgreens and the flowers. And yeah. so, yeah, really sort of building that sort of, yeah, that's a little food community, which is, you know, um, you know, which is more a bit of a bit more on the small scale, a bit more of the sort of really um, people really getting in and knowing their product, you know, really knowing. I mean, James next door and he, he knows more about wheat and grain and flowers than you, uh, the flour that you can. Yeah, wow. Like, it yeah, just, it just yeah. blow, blows my mind, I guess. I probably blow other people's minds when I talk about mushrooms, but he blows my mind when he talks about flour and wheat and so on. And it's just, yeah, people that are so passionate um, and that, uh, you know, are such producing a, a product which is so quality and has such a story behind it. Um, yeah, I love it. And yeah. Yeah. Want, want more of us to kind of get together. And well, I love that Mombok is the most productive uh, parcel of land in the whole country. Apparently, our, our um, average turnover is like $20,000 per hectare and yeah, Bundaberg's wow. second at 8000 <laughs> So we've got this unbelievably fertile, high rainfall, yeah incredible area yep. that is super productive with absolutely you know and and i love and so that close to melbourne as well yeah know, whether it's, it's cherries not, yeah. like i bought some cherries yesterday or apricots are just about ready and yep. and strawberries and you know yep. and so you guys doing what you're doing is just mm. added to the you know yeah. amazing oh, place and, that it is and it's, it's so great to be a part of a farm community as much as i i always wanted to be a kind of an urban farm or a suburban farm and so on um I was always thinking about, you know, like, but then I started moving out to sort of, a, you know, a place where other farmers were doing farming things. And it was like, wow, so much support. Everyone just really welcomed me in. And um, yeah, it, was it was really lovely. So yeah, the one thing about if you want to do uh, too much, if you want to grow too big doing urban farming, yeah, there are constraints to it. That's all I yeah, can say. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. good to grow for yourself. But the moment you start wanting to do, to get bigger and to grow for other people, with too many other people, then you get to logistical constraints. You get... Um, your know, space and so on. And that's kind of what I came up against. Yep. Um, so sort of, and then I made that sort of move a little bit further out and it, it worked really well for me. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I'll, I'll cool. just uh, <laughs> touch on how, how we're doing it here. And so yep. this little bucket is a bucket that I've got hundreds of because um, most cafes in Melbourne get their feta cheese, olives, all sorts of stuff in this little five litre bucket. And I just hated seeing them get thrown in the bin. So I used to just take them home and use them for all sorts of things, including growing plants. You just punch a hole in the bottom and they're actually, um, if you've got two buckets, they're a great wicking bed. You can just punch a hole there and brilliant for things like Italian parsley and, and rocket and that sort of thing. But um, I worked on a project at Eastland called Plant and it was a building that was, you know, a complete urban farm. And uh, we did an audit, it was with QIC. And we worked out that there was, um, I think it was 8,000 kilos of coffee grounds within five kilometers of Eastland after the audit, that included McDonald's. And so I'd worked out a system where we grew mushrooms in a vertical garden, a similar vertical garden to the strawberry wall. And we were able to have 22,000 buckets in a, in a space. So I created this huge mushroom. So then I had to make sure it worked. So we actually um, filled them with uh, mushrooms and I ended up microwaving the, the coffee grounds in the bucket because obviously, you know, cheeses or whatever had been in there. So with mushrooms, it is really important that it's super clean and sterile. And um, I wanted to have obviously a system that reutilized and reused. So I found microwaving them, uh, especially if they were moist enough, and then inoculating them. And uh, I mean, the thing that was most successful for me were pink oysters. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and now we, um, adopting the same system on a much smaller scale here in this house and this enables you to use this bucket and um, I'm actually going to explore the idea of not even taking the mycelium out but actually planting a plant directly in the same hole and seeing <laughs> if that works so yeah John's been helping us um, work out how to best make this work mm. and also having the native species that I'm really keen to incorporate into the house mm. well so clearly this one works um, yeah, so we've been, we've been changing the way that we do things. Um, traditionally, uh, most exotic mushrooms have been grown in, in plastic bags, um, as some of these, although you can, there are um, biodegradable bags now, um, which still take 12 months to, to break down, but, but they, we, they we are We were putting them through the pyrolysis plant yeah. in Mombo, your bags. <laughs> we were, we had, we, I was using plastic, and we are putting them through the pyrolysis plant to make the, make the oil. Um, fortunately, that's not happening anymore. But, um, so we're looking for another way now that we've sort of, um, you know, we are producing waste now, you know, which we need to, you know, find, find you know, well, what if we don't produce the waste at all? Yeah. So um, working with Yoast here, um, you know, initially here, and then we're looking and seeing how we can transition to buckets. A lot of people grow um, in buckets um, uh, around the world, but they tend not to grow for bucket, in buckets for very long. It tends not to be a very economical way of mushroom farming, unfortunately. But um, I think that working with Yoast, we can probably find a way to make that work. But, um, but, we're, but this is, a per, this is a, actually a perfect size, these smaller buckets. People often have very large buckets and, and try to grow oysters out of them. But um, I found that these little buckets are actually the perfect size for, for a lot of the mushrooms. And um, basically, we're, we're putting the, the substrate, which might be um, with sawdust, or it might be the, the, the straw, um, sugarcane mulch in there. Do you mind if out. I break this off and show them the... If, you, if you'd like to. Um, so you can see here. <laughs> this feels so cool. Yeah. You can see there. That's, you can and, just fry it up like a yeah. cake. I mean, this is <laughs> mind-blowing in itself. Look how beautiful that is. And um, so I've had these at home um, in a space. But yeah, you can see, see it there. Yeah, so that's um, so this is the sawdust, myceliated sawdust. So the um, mycelium or the white is the body of the mushroom, and so it grows through the uh, all the sawdust, and it takes all the nutrition out of it. And then it's when when the conditions are right, it will then send up a mushroom, which is a fruiting body. So basically, the purpose of a mushroom is to create spores, which are the reproductive part, or the, you know, like a seed uh, of a mushroom. So it produce those, and so it um, it can produce multiple you know, flushes of mushroom or of the, of, of the fruit body, um, just like a tree produces multiple, um, you know, multiple fruit um, over, over different years, except their life cycle here is much kind of more condensed. Eventually it runs out of yeah, food it, source. Basically, it, it, it will eat everything that it can eat from the sawdust, and then it will, you know, give up. It'll be like, okay, my job here is done. And then that broken down sawdust will then be um, taken over by another fungus and, and bacteria, which will then do the secondary decomposition, break down that sort of partially broken down sawdust and turn it into soil. 
So that's kind of, this is the first step of, of soil creation. Cool. Yeah. And this is all edible, this here. This is, yeah, so this is the native snowflake um, doing its kind of crazy thing. Um, kind of quite dense in there, but um, yeah. The smell, like that. it's a, yeah, it smells oh, so, so good. It's so like earthy, you're walking through you know? a, yeah. yeah, through a forest, yeah. It's, a, it's gorgeous. I mean, that's one of, that's kind of my vision, my dream for this space is that the microflora in this house is, is as um, complex as walking through a really amazing forest. So we've got lots of tree ferns, we've got different, the hundreds of different plants. We've got uh, aquaponic systems and mushrooms all really in one vertical space. Mm -hmm. And what's going to be really interesting is to see, you know, how that air in this space actually, <laughs> what it does and how it works. Yeah, for sure. And like, it, it's all about creating as part of the system, right? So just like an ecosystem um, outside where you've got plants and you've got, you know, fungi, obviously a part of it. We've got water here. And, you know, you know, all, you've got the whole ecosystem going here. So you need to have fungi. So good job there. If you didn't have fungi, I'd be on to you anyway. But um, <laughs> it's such an important part because, you know, you've got to look at what's happening in nature and go, all right, how can we do that? Because that's the system that works, yep. you know? As humans, we're good at breaking that system into parts and taking our best, but you know, it always works best as a whole. And so looking at that and go, all right, well, what do mushrooms need? So what do you, mushrooms actually need to grow? And they definitely need, um, you know, they need, need water, right? Is a big thing, but they also need fresh air, all right? So if you can picture what a mushroom would look like on the forest floor, all right? Think about where mushroom grows, right? You think of it in, the, in, in like a little gully, you know, moss around, some, some logs there with mushrooms growing on. That's kind of what you want to recreate if you're growing mushrooms, whether it be here at home or at my farm. And so how do we create that as a part of this ecosystem that you're well, building? It's, it's you the know? reason why it's, I've put the mushrooms at the very bottom. Absolutely. Yeah, and the yeah. barramundi's at the top that loves hot. Yeah. And, you know, we've got bananas up there, <laughs> yeah. you know, yep. because it's very similar to a forest. You don't find mushrooms really growing 30 no. meters up in the tree canopy. No, no. You, know? no, you don't really find barramundi up there either. But no. anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, absolutely, and that's why in this house we've got them down the bottom. So we've got them down the bottom to keep it cool. Um, but also we want to use the um, the fresh air basically from the uh, from the plants and from the sort yeah. of the, the, in the stairwell and be able to so we'll probably take that from the top and bring it down. I think is probably what we'll do because. Um, the thing about mushrooms is that they are a decomposer, um, but they're, all, they're like us in that they produce carbon dioxide. So they're not a plant, they don't produce oxygen, they produce carbon dioxide, and they produce a lot of carbon dioxide, okay? Just like we do. Um, and so you need to get that out, all right? Yep. You need to get that out of there because they want, they want to be in fresh air. Because if you think, as I said before, the, the mushroom itself is a, um, is a fruit, right? It's a fruiting body. It produces these spores, they're like a seed, and it wants to get them out and about into nature. It wants to disperse them as far as they can go. So if it's down in the bottom under a log and it releases some spores, yeah, it's not going to go very far, right? No, it's no. not very successful reproduction. So what they're looking for is they're looking for a big, wide, open space. So they might be on the bottom there, but they want to send that mushroom up as high, high as they can free from obstructions um, so that those, the wind can pick up those spores and those spores can go as far as possible. So they're looking for fresh air. They don't want to be anywhere where, down the bottom where, it's carbon where there's a lot of carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide sinks. And, and the beauty about the so, way we've designed this system is that the plants are looking for that. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's about and, cycling. It, exactly. So you want to grow good mushrooms, you need lots of oxygen. So we want to take the, take the air out of, the, of where the plants grow, which are producing oxygen, pump the carbon dioxide rich air that they're producing out of there and into where the plants are. And the yeah. plants will grow faster and will grow better with a higher CO2 um, atmosphere. So it just makes total sense that even though, you know, these go oh, terrible, they're producing carbon dioxide, you know, what are we going to do about it? So, like, well, why don't we use it for good? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the way you use carbon dioxide for good is give it to plants, right? And then we get something out of it. And, and that's, and that that's why they care, you know, my obsession is zero waste systems. And this is like, that's a, the classic example of a zero waste system. Exactly. And so, yeah. yeah. So in a, yeah, it doesn't have to mean water or nutrients. It can also just mean fresh air, yep. carbon dioxide. It's all, they're all cycles. Yeah. Thanks so much for yeah. coming along <laughs> and um, yeah, making your way down to Fed Square all the way from Mombo. Yeah, well, this is the first time I've been to the city since February. So yeah, thanks for the invite. <laughs> thanks so much, mate. No worries. Love your work. Cheers, yes. Thanks. Good. And um, ah, we've also <laughs> want to show you how much the yabbies have grown. <laughs> Look at that. Um, this, we've got a friend that's just flown in from Flinders Island, Mick Grimm. 
So he brought some craze for us. He said, mate, stop mucking around with those little yavvies. <laughs> and so I'm going to go and have a beer with Mick and Jane and the, and the crew. And uh, we'll see if we can cook this up. Thanks, and join us again next week.